It is a honor and privilege to introduce Professor Andrea Goetz from the University of California at Los Angeles, who, as you know, is also last year's winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of a supermassive uh, compact object in the Milky Way. The prize is shared with uh, Reinhard Getzel and Roger Penrose. So Professor Getz has been the fourth female physicist to be awarded the Nobel Prize, as you know. And in our much shorter history of invisible uh, meetings, she's also the fourth Nobel laureate uh, to participate in our meetings, for which we are most grateful. So um, I just pass the microphone to Professor Getz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just get my slide shared here. Um, so I'm thrilled to be able to share the work that we've been doing over the last um, 26 years um, at the center of the galaxy originally driven by the question, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy as a way of demonstrating that these objects exist? Before I get too far into this, I really wanna um, give a lot of credit to my collaborators. This is a program that started off with a very small team. Um, and I really in particular wanna note Eric Becklin and Mark Morris who have collaborated with through this entire time. And then my very first grad student, um, Beth Klein. Since then, this project, the scope has expanded scientifically um, in large part because the technology has um, advanced um, so much. But along with that expansion has come um, with an expansion of the team. So today the core team is about um, 30 people. And in particular, I'd like to call out um, Tuan Do and Jessica Liu, who both started as uh, graduate students on this project and now are professors with their own students and postdocs collaborating on this, on this project. This project has also now become a key science case for the development of high resolution imaging technology at the Keck telescope, as well as for the future 30 meter telescope. And in that endeavor, we have a, a broader network of about 100 people that we work with. It's been a, a fascinating journey um, of going from a project, actually that I'll show you that the first, I, it, I came to UCLA to, to get access to the Keck Observatory and my very first proposal to, to do this project was actually turned down. So it's gone from something where we are having to fight for get, to get on the telescope and a very small team to a really, a very diff, different enterprise. So it's it's been, a, a, a really um, interesting and uh, lots of uh, delightful journey of, of the development of science. So there's two very big per picture perspectives on um, the science behind this project. From a physics perspective, the original question was driven by the question of do supermassive black holes exist? And then today that's moved into the question of um, understanding how gravity works near um, in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. So really trying to get at um, tests of Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity in regimes that have, been not, have not been explored before. So while these, are, these objects are outcomes of his ideas, uh, we also know that, that they also represent the breakdown of our understanding of how um, uh, general relativity works with quantum mechanics. A second big picture perspective is looking at the astrophysical role that these objects play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. So while at the outset of this project, when we were first reporting the results, the thinking around the relationship between supermassive black holes, the ones that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, and the host galaxies um, was a framing of um, which came first, the black hole or the galaxy, very much like the, you know, the chicken or the egg question, which came first. But today we understand that that is probably not the correct framework because today we recognize that there's a correlation between the mass of supermassive black holes and the mass of the, their host galaxies, and in particular, the bulge of these galaxies. It's a very a well-defined relationship where the mass seems to be roughly 0.1% of the mass of the, of the central part of the galaxy. So in looking at this, we have a unique opportunity to look at the feedback that must exist between um, the central black hole and their host galaxy. All right, to really go back, 
and look at what we're trying to do. The most direct test of the existence of black holes is to demonstrate that there is um, some amount of mass confined within um, its short shield radius. So remembering that the short shield radius is just an abstract um, size because the black hole itself has no finite size. And if we think about the case for these different kinds of black holes, I just want to remind us that the idea of, of black holes generated were, was generated by our thinking about stellar mass black holes, black holes that are roughly 10 times the mass of the sun. And these things were um, were originally thought of when people were considering the evolution of the most massive stars in our galaxy. So stars that were more massive than 30 times the mass of the sun, it was theoretically predicted that these would become black holes. So theory led and observations have beautifully supported the existence of stellar mass black holes, um, in particular the gravitational wave experiments um, really um, demonstrate the existence of these objects. The case for the supermassive black holes um, is quite different. Um, these were not predicted theoretically, but rather it was observations that suggested the existence of these objects. In particular, observations of um, galaxies known as active galactic nuclei, or AGN for short. And in these galaxies, as their name suggests, their nuclei or centers are very active. This is a picture taken at radio wavelengths, so very long um, wavelength observations that highlights two um, phenomena in particular that drove the thinking about supermassive black holes. The first is the um, presence of these really energetic jets of emission that are coming out from the core. So you can measure the kinematic energy of these jets and that suggests a very powerful central engine. The second piece of evidence that people pointed to was the emission at the core, um, really at the center of the galaxy, where the emission was unlike anything produced by stars or gas in the rest of the galaxy. And the gas, the, this emission suggested very high velocities, so suggesting a very compact object. So it was these, these observations that suggested um, roughly half a century ago that, the, uh, that it was possible um, uh, to, to think about black holes that would be a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So this is what motivated the thinking about supermassive black holes. And very quickly, this led to the idea that maybe all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes and not just this subset of AGNs, which are roughly 10% of all galaxies. Now, so we're going to look at for supermassive black holes at the center of normal galaxies, and there's nothing in particular that suggests the presence of a black hole at the center. And I just want to highlight that if the, this is a galaxy that would look very much like our own if we could get outside of it and look back. Of course, our sun is about halfway out and we're looking towards the center. And the center of galaxies, um, even in normal galaxies, are much more ex extreme than out here in what I would call the stellar sub, um, the, the suburbs of the galaxy. The densities are much higher. They're about a, um, a billion times higher. And almost any way you can ex um, describe the properties of the galaxy, they get much more extreme at the center of the galaxy. And this is going to come back later in the talk where we look at the astrophysical richness of this environment around the central supermassive black hole. Now, our galaxy is certainly the best place to look for the presence of a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies because it has the advantage of being the closest center of a galaxy that we'll ever have to study. The next closest galaxy is 100 times further away. So we, we have a lot more ability to see a lot more detail. So that's definitely the advantage of studying the center of the galaxy. But like in life, for every pro, there's usually a con. And the con comes from um, the fact that we live in the galaxy and that we have to look through the plane of the galaxy towards the center to see it. So this is a picture, a photograph actually from Hawaii, the side of uh, on the big island uh, uh, on Mauna Kea, which is actually where the, the telescope that we use is located. I mean, what you see very be beautifully is the plane of the galaxy th uh, through the, the starlight, but you presumably will also notice the dust lane that travels through the center of the galaxy or through the plane of the galaxy. So our galaxy has a tremendous amount of dust in addition to all the stars um, that reside in our galaxy. And that dust is very good at obstructing optical light. So only one out of every 10 billion photons that are emitted from the center of the galaxy makes it to us. So it's basically invisible at optical wavelengths. 
But if you go to the infrared, and in particular two microns, one out of every 10 photons makes it to us so that we can actually detect it. So a key part of this experiment, there's many technical developments that led to this experiment being uh, becoming possible. But one of the first ones was the advances in infrared detectors, and in particular, low read noise um, detectors that, um, that were really being developed or making lots of progress um, roughly uh, 30 years ago when we began this project. So this is an overly simplistic um, picture of what we're trying to do that lets us um, think about um, um, the, the observations. So the key here is to make a dynamical measurement of the mass at the center of the galaxy. And there are many approaches to getting dynamical masses. In the beginning, when we first proposed this experiment, we proposed it as a, a project to go for just three years. And even that at the time was um, uh, people were skeptical um, that it would work for, for reasons that I'll get into in a minute. So the idea was to measure the velocity dispersion, which is a pretty standard technique for measuring the dynamical mass uh, of, a, of a system. So we were looking at the ensemble average or the dispersion of the, of the velocities. And, and the way this was tr not traditional is typically people look at um, spectra to measure the velocity dispersion along your line of sight. But what we were proposing here was actually to take images, a sequence of images and to measure the proper motions. So to get the proper motions individually and to, um, to get the, the plane of the sky dispersion. That ended up working out incredibly well. And for reasons, um, well, actually, it's, it's sort of interesting in terms of the tension that this created, because in the early days, there was a lot of skepticism about whether or not what we were seeing was actually a black hole. And these, dis, these ensemble average techniques um, have a lot of embedded assumptions so that you assume the distribution of stars, you assume um, the kinds of orbits they're, they're on to get the masses. Furthermore, you, because you're taking an average, you're, enclosed, you're measuring an enclosed mass that's within a, a, statistically, a statistical average. So to do better, you can, get, you, can, um, you can go to the individual orbits. So once we had actually gotten to this point, it became clear that the individual orbits were possible. And that's what really got us going on a very um, long-term project, which um, was to measure the individual orbits. That eliminates all assumptions about the kinds of orbits and the distributions of the, of the stars um, that you're measuring and allows you to confine the mass to a much smaller volume, which really advances the argument for the black hole by quite a bit. Okay, so because, you're, um, because the goal is to um, detect the stars that are as close to the center of the galaxy as possible, the key to this experiment is to get to the highest angular resolution possible. So that tells you why I was um, interested in getting access to the Keck telescope. So I actually came to UCLA because I really wanted to use um, the, it was new at the time, to use these telescopes in a new and different way. Um, maybe to explain or to, um, to help people understand why the, the experiment, which now seems so obvious, was, co was um, controversial in the beginning, one of the technical innovations of the Keck telescope, so this is the largest telescope in the world at optical and infrared wavelengths, and the way it achieved the, the diameter of the telescope was to, it, rather than using a single mirror, was to use a segmented um, uh, strategy. So this, you know, this has become the way that large telescopes are built today. It's the basis for the future TMT and the European Extremely Large Telescope. But at the time, it was, it was really controversial. So the telescope mirror is made of 36 hexagonal segments, each of which is roughly 1.8 meters in, in diameter. So you have to align these segments to a fraction of the wavelength that you want to observe at. So initially, this was the first experiment that demanded that the telescope was um, lined up well enough, the mirror was lined up well enough to get to the diffraction limit, the theoretical angular resolution of the telescope. So um, our strategy in the early days was very different than what we use um, today. So there was a first decade of a, of a fairly simple approach to getting the, to the diffraction limit. Okay, so the getting to the diffraction limit is hard for ground-based telescopes because of the atmosphere. It's great for us. It allows us to survive here on Earth but it is a total headache for studying the universe. This gives you a little bit of a sense of the problem. This is actually some of the first data that we took on the center of the galaxy. 
what we eventually learned is that the black hole is exactly where this cursor is. We knew where to point, or we suspected we knew where to point, because there's an unusual radio source where the density distribution of stars uh, peak. Its name is Sag A star. It's an awful name for this object. It's a radio source where the, the people who discovered it in the 70s were trying to be clever. They were referring to nuclear physics, where asterisk means excited state. So it's really Sag A not a star because they were referring to the fact that it didn't look like a star, didn't look like a star. So this is the emissive source associated with the black hole. Um, but it's a very wimpy source. It's like a very, 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 very faint um, active galactic nuclei um, source. But it, it could be easily explained by many other, many other stellar uh, accreting objects. Okay, so what we're seeing here are images that are a tenth of a second. And what you can see is the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. So if there were no atmosphere, each of these five bright stars would be the size of the smallest structures that are dancing around and they would be rock solid still. So this is the problem of the atmosphere. And in the early days, we did a technique that's called speckle imaging. And speckle imaging works on the principle of just analyzing each frame as a set of interference patterns um, so that you can deconvolve what the atmosphere is doing to you compared to what the underlying object is. So it's hardware simple. In other words, the number of modifications that we had to make to the existing instruments at Keck were pretty minor. They were just to um, change the plate scale or the pixel scale rather, and to allow the electronics to figure out how to get the electronics to read out much faster than um, the instrument was originally designed to do without um, making the read noise blow up. So it's hardware simple and software complex. So all the work was done in in, in software. And that works out pretty well. And where we've gone is a tech to is a uh, today is a technique called adaptive optics. I've actually um, left out the, the slides that show how this technique works. But let me just say that it's a system in which you imp um, you introduced um, in which we introduce mirrors that can take on the conjugate shape to the wavefront error that's introduced by the atmosphere. So the simplistic way I like to explain this is you can think about the atmosphere basically being like a circus funhouse mirror, which distorts your, your images. And you want your deformable mirror in your adaptive optic system to take on the exact opposite shape so that your wavefront um, is once again flat. Um, and this works amazingly well. And it, it's useful, again, to recognize what enable these technological advancements. Um, adaptive optics was, was, was being developed within astronomy and astrophysics. But in fact, there are other communities that care a lot about um, looking through the atmosphere, including the military. And of course, the military has far more money than the astronomy and astrophysics community does. So in the, the mid-90s, it, it was declassified. And so in our field, there was a huge step forward in terms of uh, just understanding. I mean, then the job became just understanding how to use, how to design these systems for astronomical uses. So Keck had um, some of the uh, one of the first scientifically productive adaptive optic systems on a on a large telescope. And here you see an animation that just basically shows the difference between a long exposure and a cleaned up picture. Um, the five bright stars that we were looking at before are shown here. And then, of course, the stars of interest that we want to watch or we want to measure how they move are here. So again, this demonstrates that, A, the techniques do work. You do see stars. And of course, I should have mentioned that the other feedback that we got in the beginning was concerned that you just wouldn't see stars at the location that were um, necessary. And that even if we did, that you couldn't actually see them move. So while we're going to focus a lot in this region in the coming slides, and in fact, what I'm now going to show you is just a fourth of the real estate in here, so you can see what's happened. I want to emphasize that um, we actually track a much larger region that, than is even shown here today, and we track thousands of stars. And it's important that we track those stars. In the beginning, for velocity dispersion work, you have to track all the stars to understand really um, what the mass is. And as you get into the orbit game, you need to track all those stars because you need to get into a constant astrometric reference frame. In other words, you need to position all your images so that they're all in the same coordinate system. 
And that turns out to be one of the hardest parts of this experiment in terms of where we're going um, uh, today. So this is where, um, this is the central region and it shows how the stars have moved over the last 25 years. You probably can find my favorite star in the galaxy or in the universe. Its name is SO2. It's the most powerful probe at the central potential because it has complete orbital phase coverage, both astrometrically, in other words, with images, so you can get the positions. And when stars are measured positionally or with images, they're trailed by a dashed line. Some stars pop up in the middle. It's not because they're getting bright up, but because our, our technology is getting better. So adaptive optics allows us to see much deeper than we could with the first decade of measurements and much more um, accurately. And then the other part of this animation that um, is important is that um, once adaptive optics comes online, you can actually measure not just images. You, know, you improve your um, positional accuracy by a factor of 10 and your sensitivity by a, roughly a factor of 10. But you also, for the first time, can take um, pictures at different wavelengths and you can get spectra you, um, of these um, stars. And that's incredibly astrophysically rich uh, once you introduce spectroscopy to this work uh, it, along many, many um, dimensions. But for just understanding the central potential, that gives you the motion along your line of sight. Okay, so stars are trailed by a solid line once you can get to, once you obtain the spectra or the radial velocities, or the velocity along the line of sight for that particular star. So there's actually some evolution in just the instrumentation behind the adaptive optics that expands our ability to, to, to get spectra. Okay, so SO2, what does SO2 do for us? At the outset of this experiment, um, we knew that there was 4 million times the mass of the sun inside a very large region. This actually came from work done in the late 80s by Charlie Towns' group, where they were measuring the velocity to, uh, the velocities through spectroscopy of gas. And the region that they could confine that mass to was, was really large. So it was so much larger than the region that you would need to, to demonstrate that there was a black hole. That if you, Looking at their paper, the suggestion that this, that this might be a black hole is not in the title, it's not in the abstract, it's, it's a one paragraph suggestion in the discussion section. And, and that's simply because this radius that the mass was confined to was very large. And there were two other arguments that were made at, at about this time. One is that if you measure the velocity or the motion of the dynamics of the gas, the gas can be moved around by a lot of other things. So people were pointing out that there are, there's a lot of massive stars in this region. These massive stars have winds. So the winds can affect the, the, the motion of the gas. So that was concern number one. And then concern number two was that some of these bright stars, these, all these bright stars that you see, one, I'll just remind you that this is an adaptive optics picture. So just blur this by about a factor of, of, uh, of 10 and you'd get what, you would, what was known at the time. But these were recognized to be young stars. And as I'll get to, young stars are hard to form in the vicinity of a black hole. So in fact, people use the presence of these young stars at large radii to say, well, you couldn't possibly have a black hole because the tidal forces are so great that you would prevent or you would suppress star formation if this was an indeed a black hole. Okay, so that was the framework going in. And what this orbits have done for us is to show that there is still 4 million times the mass of the sun inferred by those orbits, but it's confined to a volume that's a factor of 10 million times smaller. So since many of the arguments are, uh, around this, um, the case for a black hole is based on density, what this has done is to enhance or, um, the evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes by a factor of 10 million, moving it from a possibility really to a certainty. So the scale, um, just to give you a sense of scale, that um, these orbits have confined the mass to corresponds to the size of our solar system. Let me also point out that since this has gone in progression of going through velocity dispersions, dispersions to orbits, the velocity dispersion gets you the first factor of a thousand. And then, then the orbits um, go the last uh, factor of 10,000 to bring you the full factor of, of uh, 10 million in enhancement in the evidence. 
All right, so that's that's really what's being recognized um, with the Nobel Prize, which is the the strength of the evidence for the existence of a supermassive black hole, which is now which is now we now have the strongest case for the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of our our own galaxy, uh, which is rather ironic because it's actually the active galactic nuclei that um, that introduced the concept in the in the first place. Today, our our scientific interest is no longer focused on the presence or the demonstration of the existence of, a, of the supermassive black hole, but has really moved in other directions. And the advances in our technology have really enabled a, a, a richness in the kind of um, science pursuits that we're engaged in. And, it, and, it, and there are many, many different offshoots based on the data sets that we collect that are primarily driven by getting the most precise measurements of um, the central potential through dynamical motions. So let me give you a sense of some of the problems that we're pursuing today. Um, and there are two primary like branches as I started off with, sort of the, the, the physics piece, like tests of, of, of gravity, and then the astrophysical piece. So let me start with the astrophysical piece. The astrophysical piece, I have to say, has been actually both of them have been incredibly fun, um, uh, and they're fun because um, while we set up, you, we set off to you know we define the experiment based on a clear question. There's actually more questions than answers that have come out of this work. So almost every prediction that one could make for what we should see around the central supermassive black hole based on our understanding of black hole um, host galaxy, galaxy interactions has been inconsistent with the observations. So you know, I joke, you could say job security, or you could say kid in a candy shop, which is really what it feels like. There's just so many um, interesting problems. So let me just give you um, um, a, a, a few um, a few examples, three in particular that this animation is designed um, to address. So in this animation, we color code the kinds of stars that we're tracking. So with adaptive optics, for the first time, we can we can understand these stars not just as the canonical test particle in a gravitational field, but we can astrophysically understand what kind of stars these are. And as I've already alluded to, you, you don't expect young stars in this region because of the strong tidal forces. And not only are there young stars out at distances where we could measure before um, these high resolution imaging uh, techniques came along, but um, now with adaptive optics, uh, um, you can see that the dominant um, population in this field are actually young stars. Oh, I should mention. <laughs> So this makes sense that um, the aqua, the blue green stars are the young stars. So they're, they're the most common kind of star that we see, the ones that we say shouldn't be there if there's a black hole. So now we're sure there's a black hole and there are these young stars. And, and I like to call this problem the paradox of youth. And, and, it, and it is, and it's, um, the, 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 the problem is quite pronounced. So the way one can think about the problem is if you think about the gas densities that are necessary to overcome the tidal forces of the black hole, um, in the center of this image, um, in terms of the distances there, um, the densities would have to be a factor of um, 10 to the 11th times higher than what is seen there today. So it's not just a little inconsistency, it's an enormous in inconsistency. And this has driven a lot of theoretical work in terms of how can you get what appears to be young stars in this inhospitable region. And the, the classes of solutions that have come up are really threefold. One is Perhaps this environment um, creates stars that look like young stars, but aren't. They're old. They form someplace else. They migrated in. Maybe they're dark matter infused stars so that they look, you know, they have different characteristics or they alter their, their, their characteristics. So that was one class of solutions. Another class was 
maybe these things are formed elsewhere and migrate in very quickly. So they would have to migrate in um, on a time scale of a million years. That's, a nor that's, a, that's very rapid for dynamical friction. So basically just interactions with uh, um, the, the background. Um, so that's an idea, but that would use, that would leave a trail of, of stars. Um, and these stars really do look young. They don't look, there's nothing about them as we've been able to study them in more and more detail um, with um, more advanced instrumentation. Spectroscopically, they look like a, just a typical young star. And as you see in this animation, it's like right at this point, what's emer what has emerged over time, because or you know the orbits get to be longer periods as you go further and further out. So you have to be patient and you have to develop your understanding of the central potential to get the orbits at larger radii. But as these are emerging, you see that the, many of these young stars share a plane, um, a common, or basically have a common angular momentum um, uh, for their orbital angular momentum. And that's suggestive that they did form in a pre-existing accretion disk, um, which really, which has a lot of interesting implications. So if the densities were much higher in the past, just a few million years ago, that suggests that our galaxy probably was much more like an active galactic nuclei in its relatively recent past. And there's definitely observations at higher energies that, that suggest that, that that indeed could be true. So that's our current thinking about the young stars. The old stars, the um, orange stars in here, the old stars should be, the prediction is that there should be tons of them. And in fact, we use that prediction that the density of old stars should be enhanced near the black hole. That's often used to find black holes at dis, more, in more distant galaxies where you look for the enhancement of, of um, stars or, um, at, at the center. And yet we don't see them. Where are they? There's a dearth of old stars. And then the, one of my favorites I have to say today are the pink stars, the magenta stars. These are things that we didn't even think to predict. These are the first spatially resolved, tidally interacting objects uh, at the center of the galaxy. And they, you see their um, geometry evolve through, through our observations. I should say, th these really re required adaptive optics. You don't see them at two microns. They're so red, they're so cool that you only see them at longer wavelengths. It's super easy to see them at, in a three or five micron image. Um, and then we also see them spectroscopically through a mission line um, observation. So you see them far away. And as they come towards the black hole, they stretch out, they elongate, they pass by the black hole and they become compact. So this has been an interesting study. The first example of it, um, of, these, of this class of stars was called G2. And my current, um, and, and again, there's been a lot of different thinking about what these objects could be ranging from gas clouds, um, the original suggestion, to um, what I'm, um, what intrigues me today for reasons that I'm happy to um, get into later, is the idea that these are are probably were originally binary stars that the black hole um, uh, drove to merge through three body interactions um, known as the Kozai-Lidov effect. And if you start to think about the role of black holes in driving binary star mergers, this might um, this actually provide potentially provide some useful insights into the uh, gravitational wave sources, which are producing stellar mass black holes that are much larger than we expect, and that are occurring more frequently th than we expect. So understanding the role of central black holes in driving mergers might, um, might uh, provide some interesting insight. So I'm not suggesting that these are stellar mass black holes. These are probably two um, main sequence, typical main sequence stars. So stars um, like our sun that were driven to merge. And when they merge, they become really bloated and it's easy to tear off the outer outer shell um, of these stars. So these, these, these are tremendously fun and has, have also driven um, us to really um, look for um, and understand the binary star population at the center of the galaxy, which is yet another, another angle. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. There's actually a lot more that you could say astrophysically because I really wanna end this talk with a few comments about the, where we are on the um, sort of fundamental physics probe. Once you have complete orbits, you actually, um, can start to you enter the regime of being able to do some of the some of the first direct tests 
of um, how gravity works near a supermassive black hole. So I want to emphasize you need a complete orbit because you need to know the geometry um, of, of the star's trajectory, the, sh uh, the shape, where the star is in, um, you know, in, in, uh, in space time. So that short period star that I emphasized before, SO2, its orbital period is 16 years. So this is, this is an experiment that really requires patience because you got to wait 16 years. And then the next time it goes through an important turning point, which is either the closest approach or furthest approach, you're in business. So for many, many years, that was, um, we were focused on 2018 because that was that moment where you had a complete orbit and you get to the first closest approach. And now we're headed towards the first furthest approach. And I'll, and I'll share why that's important. So the first closest approach allows you to really get at tests of the um, relativistic redshift. Okay, so what you're looking at there is you're looking at um, the test of looking at how the photon is affected, um, how it loses energy as it climbs out of the potential, the gravitational potential well. Okay, so it's an extra term on the Doppler shift. Um, uh, and then, the, um, the, so I'll, I'll show you the results of this. And then you're looking for the precession of the periapse, which is looking at how the object itself moves through space time. So the idea that it's not gonna come, the orbit will not come back to the exact same place, but will go in a prograde sense if you're only affected by gravity. So 2018, 2018 was a really fun year for us. It turns out there were three important measurements within the course of six months. So we used to say we were 2018 or bust, but I really wanna emphasize, okay, so the prediction is that the, the extra effective um, shift, wavelength shift over the Newtonian piece. So you can see that there's this huge change going from 4,000 to minus 2,000 kilometers per second as it goes through closest approach. And there's this extra 200 kilometer per second piece that we're looking for. Okay, so this plot is the measurements. And this is the, these are the measurements relative to the best fit um, Newtonian component. Okay, so you're looking for this extra 200 kilometers per second. The dashed line here is the expected from GR. If it were purely Newtonian, well, you're differencing it from Newtonian, so it'd be flat. So you definitely see this 200 kilometers per second. I want to warn you, though, to think about this plot carefully because it's differential. <laughs> and, it, and the biggest source of uncertainty is the geometry of the orbit. Okay, so um, that um, everything is well behaved. And this measurement will just get better as you understand that the geometry of the orbit better. Um, okay, so today, first probe, Einstein gets a check. Okay, what excites me more um, is where we are today. Okay. So this is ready to, at least I'm ready to talk about this, but I'm also ready to tell you why we're not publishing it yet. In other words, why you should be skeptical. So the next part is the, the precession of the orbit. So again, this, 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 this theory is really exaggerated. So it's the precession, prograde precession. So the orbit should go in the direction of, of the orbit. The precession should go in the direction of the orbit. But what we actually see, and this is very preliminary, is the orbit going in the opposite direction at twice the rate. Okay, so like the other, when things don't work as, as predicted, that's when things get interesting. Okay, so why, let's, let's, let me just take two, two, two perspectives. One is you've got the physics right. Okay, so what gives you the retrograde orbit? That what can give you the retrograde orbit is extended mass around the black hole, and SO two is on very on quite an eccentric orbit. It's higher. It's slightly higher than point point eight. So what you're really seeing is the difference between the mass at closest approach and the mass at furthest approach. And how we model this is the 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 mass that is within the furthest approach, which is 0.01 parsecs, and it's slightly under. Um, 20,000 times the mass of the sun. Okay, so that's an interesting number. And it's further interesting because the, remember I said that the cusp is missing in the old stars? If you think about what, how much mass should be in the cusp, it's about this value. So it's not crazy physically, but here's why you have to be concerned. Unlike the spectroscopy piece, the gravitational redshift, which is really mostly um, a spectroscopic measurement, um, this is mostly in the imaging space, the precession. 
And what's really hard, unlike the spectroscopy, which is really easy to put every, well, relatively easy and relatively well-established how you do this, how you get everything in the same coordinate system. You just use all the, you use quantum mechanics. Here, you have to use um, all the, the, you have to get into a uh, constant astrometric reference frame. Anybody who does astrometry, positional work will tell you this is really hard. <laughs> and at the Galactic Center, it's even harder because you're in, um, you're in a, all this, all your reference stars are in the same central potential that you're trying to measure. So you have to be very careful and it's very easy to go wrong. Okay, so this is why you should be um, suspicious. I could say a lot more, but this is what keeps me up at night these days. But it's worth working harder on because this is a, it's a really interesting thing to get into the, the probes of precession, either as a test of GR or as, a, a, as, a, as the discovery of um, dark matter at the center of the galaxy. Okay, I'm not going to go into these next slides, except to say we're working a lot on new technologies, improving our adaptive optics system, which of course is important for CAC and the future 30 meter telescope or the European Extremely Large Telescope. Pick your large telescope. All of this is important. And today we only see a the tip of the iceberg in terms of the stars that we see. So all of this is going to open up so much more. I mean, we're really only seeing the brightest stars. And the analogy I like to make is it would be like trying to understand the economy if we could only see the biggest transactions. So it might be that we see all these mysteries simply because we can't see the, the bulk of the population. Most stars are faint, not bright. So we're missing all those small transactions or those, those small stars. Okay, so if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that we have extremely strong evidence for the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And through the development of technology, we actually have more questions than answers. So there's lots more that remains to be done. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. This was a beautiful and inspiring talk. Um, so are there any questions? Please raise your hand. This was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about the adaptive optics. So um, let's say that you are able to effectively reduce all of the atmospheric noise that you have. Are you then diffraction limited or is there another noise um, piece that, that becomes dominant, say acoustic noise or vibrational noise or just shot noise or your dark current? What for, for your setup, what becomes the dominant noise contribution? Well, right now, um, st we're still limited by the atmosphere. So um, behind me, you see um, the, the two kecks and you see one laser coming out of each. It's just actually, um, so it's two adaptive optic systems. They're running independently. But let me just emphasize that with one laser where you're creating an artificial spot, actually what you're really doing is there's a thin layer of sodium atoms up at 90 kilometers, thanks to meteorites coming down to the, um, to the earth. And the structure of the atmosphere just happens to trap sodium atoms up at 90 kilometers in a very thin layer at four kilometers. So you, sh you um, take a laser, you stimulate those sodium atoms um, to shine, and you have an artificial star. 90 kilometers is really close compared to the, um, your stars. So if you think about the geometry of this, you have um, the starlight, the, sorry, the artificial starlight coming down to your telescope in a cone. Whereas your starlight from your, the center of the galaxy is coming through um, a cylinder. So this is called the cone effect because that's that um, you're only probing the, this cone. And the larger your telescope um, is, the more pronounced this cone effect is. So at the center of the galaxy today, with one laser, you only get um, correct 30% of the atmospheric um, problem. So you put 30% in a diffraction limited core, and then you have this halo that remains, um, that's sort of the, the, the original seeing that this diffraction limited core sits on top of. So the first thing is to do this, that, that multiple lasers. So you're basically doing um, what's called laser tomography. So like a CAT scan on the atmosphere. Um, so through those different probes, you can actually get rid of the cone effect. So that helps you at CAC, but it he even helps you even more for the next generation of telescopes. So for the next generation of telescopes, if you only had a single laser, you would only correct about 
of you'd have a three you'd have three percent of your energy in a diffraction limited core that's kind of like speckle era performance which is pretty lousy so you really need that um uh next set and there are a whole bunch of different um pieces that you have to think through in terms of what might limit you so it's not only your mapping of the atmosphere but it's um in your deformable mirror that you're moving around how many segments are in the deformable mirror? So today, if we go to this multiple laser system, what will then limit us is the fact that the um, segment size in our deformable mirror is, is too large. Um, if, if you can overcome all of these problems, <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's, there, the adaptive optic systems are so complicated that you, you hit the, you, your, your performance is limited. You, know, you, you always hit the, you, you try to reduce the tallest tent pole. So let's see, we've got the lasers, then we've got the deformable mirror. And then another piece that you have to pay a lot of attention to is the read noise of not your science camera, but the read noise of the detector that's looking at your, um, your, either your artificial star or um, um, what I haven't talked about is you need a, a natural star to give you the overall tilt. So there's two, there's basically, there's two, there's two camera systems supporting your adaptive optic system. So then you have to worry about that, the read noise of that because you have to read out so quickly, you, you're really read noise limited there. So it's really exciting that a lot of people are developing adapt next generation adaptive optic systems because each system thinks about a different component. Um, so they're really com they're, they're complex. There's lots of room for improvement. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. So maybe we pass to the next question, Alvaro. Hi, thank you for the talk. Coming back to dark matter, the day you begin to be convinced that you have seen something like dark matter, how are you going to decide it's something interesting and not lots of gas or Jupiter or something like that? That's a great question. You know, how do you disentangle um, the various baryonic compared to non-baryonic sources of, of, of dark matter? Um, and I think um, one possibility is by the time you get to the 30 meter telescope, you can start to um, look for the discrete events that um, I guess from your perspective would say be the non-interesting <laughs> version. <laughs> um, but it is a hard problem. Um, so, you know, we have to solve the first problem of believing it. Um, and then the second problem of what is it? Um, I, yeah, so I, I hope we get that opportunity <laughs> to think that through. <laughs> Do this standard models of uh, dark matter in the center of the galaxy agree more or less with the amount that you think might be there? Well, you know, the, 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 the cross-sections have, have come down. So at the beginning, um, the amount of dark matter um, um, from particles versus, um, say, you know, stellar remnants were, were comparable. But today, the predictions are that the, the, the particle cross-sections are so low that, they're not, that you would expect it to be the non-interesting one. I see. So thanks very much. I'm not going to continue because you probably have things even more important than talking to us. <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure to talk to this audience. Yeah. So it has been our pleasure to listen to you. It was really fantastic. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, this is yes, uh, just a minute. Talk. On on behalf of the network and on the workshop, I want to thank you for your kindness of being here. And thank you very, very much. This was great, really great. And we hope it's not the last time you are here with us. So thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs>